Hello YouTube, Bane666 here. So uh, let's continue with the list of supposed MRA terms <laughs> as told to us by the witless bitches. Oh, sorry, I meant the witty bitches. Uh, but let's continue to the next definition, which is number seven, bitch bin. Uh, now, this is another term that I've never heard of before. I've never cr come across a bitch bin. I've no idea what it is. So let's read a definition. Noun. Drawer for skank leavings. The bitch bin is the place where MRA alpha bros keep all the feminine junk they find around their shag shack. Who's junk? Those dumb sluts who were stupid enough to have sex with them, a.k.a. bitches. The bitch bun is purely hypothetical, of course, because no MRA has actually had a woman come close enough to actually sleep with him. Now, first of all, <laughs> first of all, uh, you can see a clear example here of her trying to pull down the sexual marketplace value of MRAs as an insult. Now, if, if she didn't believe that people had a sexual marketplace value, even though she may not use that term, in principle, if she didn't believe that uh, men in general have a sexual marketplace value, then she would not be trying to pull it down as an insult. Uh, second of all, I've, I've never heard of a bitch bin before. Uh, so if a, if you sleep with a woman and she leaves something at your place, you put it in a, a, a separate bin? I would assume that you would give it back to her, or if you're never going to see her again, you throw it out. But apparently there's a place where you store it all. Now, once again, I, I have to wonder, is this part of the MGTOW glossary? And it is, it's actually part of the MGTOW glossary. I can honestly say I've never heard the term bitch bin before. But let's continue. Number eight. Dick stand. Ah, dick stand. What what would a dick stand be? Once again, this is a term I've never heard of before. Uh, I've never heard an MRA or anyone else ever use the term dick stand. So I have no idea what it what it is. It sounds like something you would rest your dick on, but I'm guessing that's not right. <laughs> so let's read the definition. Adjective. Beta males who financially or emotionally support single moms. Much like a motorcycle needs a kickstand, single moms need a dickstand to keep them upright until an alpha rider comes to ride their slutty asses home. Uh, so once again, this isn't an MRA term. It, it sounds like a uh, pickup artist term to me, but let's check the MGTOW glossary and see if it's it's there. And yes, it is. Okay, so it's basically saying that some women use men as support until something better comes along. And you know what? It's a, it's a shitty world and there are some women out there who do that. Uh, just as there are some men who uh, settle until something else comes, something better comes along. Um, the simple truth is some people are assholes. Once again, not an MRA term, not a men's rights issue. So let's go on to number nine, game. Uh, now this definitely is a pickup artist term. Let's hear a definition. Noun. What alpha bros used to get poontang. How you think like a bitch but don't act like one. If you can tell me what this word salad means, more power to you. Now here she actually has a link to the MGTOW glossary. So once again, this is confirming <laughs> my notion that she's got all these terms from a MGTOW site, um, and, and then she's just associating them as uh, men's rights. So let's have a look at this quote. When game is a learned behavior, as it is with pickup artists, PUA's attempt to convince you that after studying what women want, regardless of what they say they want, that game isn't about, and solely about, giving women what they want, regardless of what they say they want. Read that last sentence again. So... <sighs> The stupidity of this author is really astounding because here we have a definition of game which clearly refers to pickup artists on a MGTOW site. 
right? So the definition is written on a MGTOW site. It clearly refers to pickup artists, and it is criticizing them for it. Yet this is all attributed to common men's rights sayings or, or whatever. Are you fucking kidding me, you fucking moron? Seriously, how fucking ignorant can you get? I mean, not only is the term not a men's rights term, but where she got the definition from, which isn't a men's rights site, clearly is talking about pickup artists and, and criticizing them for it. <laughs> you fucking idiot. All right, so let, let's go on to the next one. Number 10, gynocracy. I guess this might be like gynocentrism. I, I don't know. Let's, let's read her definition. Num. The hive mind of the femluminati who run everything and are mean to sad little baby men. Uh, sad little baby men. Once again, attempting to pull down the sexual marketplace value of anyone who disagrees with feminism. But it's funny that she says femluminati, uh, <laughs> considering the feminist belief in patriarchy. Okay? Maybe have a look at patriarchy theory before you start uh, accusing us of being conspiracy theorists. Let's continue. According to MRAs, the gynocrazy or gynocracy is a hive mind that believes the mere act of penis having means you're automatically wrong, the bad guy, and probably a rapist who wears polyester Trump 2016 t-shirts. Basically, dick equals bad, vag equals good. That's how feminism works, right? Uh, yeah, actually, that is exactly how feminism works. That you have hit the nail right on the head here. That is exactly how feminism works. Uh, men are bad, and women are good, or victims, right? Um, feminists promote those gender roles constantly. That's where we get the fucking term toxic masculinity from. We don't hear toxic femininity. No, of course not, because females are only good and victims, right? But but. Yeah, something about the essence of being male is just toxic in the eyes of feminism. And we see it constantly throughout the entire feminist movement. You fucking moron. But let's check again to see if uh, this appears in the MGTOW glossary. And it does. A play on the word gynocracy. A form of authoritarian rule that is imposed on the male by the female or the hive. The idea that if you have a penis, you are automatically wrong. And if you were born with a vagina, you are right about everything, even though neither could possibly be true. And, you know, this this is one I, I fully agree with the MGTOW definition on this. Yeah, I, I agree with this 100%. It's a real thing. Just read fucking any feminist article. <laughs> You'll see it constantly. Go, go read Gloss Witch. Go read an article about... Any, any article by Gloss Witch about men on the New Statesman... And uh, you'll see exactly this dick equals bad, veg equals good mentality. It, that's all she fucking does. So that's the end of part one. Let's move on to part two. HBUB scale. Uh, once again, this is a term I've never heard of. I have no idea what it is. Um, so let's, let's look at her definition. Noun. The hot bitch, ugly bitch. Scale, typically scales from UB1 to HB10. According to these arbiters of feminine eminence and distinction, an example of a UB1 would be Rosie O'Donnell on her period. Alternatively, an HB10 would be Rosie Huntington Whiteley bringing you a sandwich while wearing nothing but a smile. No mention of what point RHW would be on her menstrual cycle, but we're guessing Aunt Flo ain't knocking at the door. Okay, so it's it's basically a scale where men rate how attractive a woman is. Because uh, in the history of mankind, uh, a woman has never done that to a man. Not once. Never. <laughs> two women talking about a, a man have never, ever, ever, in the history of mankind, commented on how attractive he is or unattractive he is. Not at all. It has never actually happened apparently uh, but let's check again to see if this came well actually I don't need to check it's got a link 
So the link actually does go to the MGTOW glossary and we find the definition there. So let's move on to the next one, number 12, hypergamy. Now this is actually something that men's rights activists talk about. I don't think we talk about it excessively, but yeah, we, we do bring up hypergamy. Basically what hypergamy is, is a woman being attracted to a man of uh, similar or higher status. So in other words, uh, most women don't marry down, or what they would consider marrying down. But let's, um, let's read her definition. The urge all women have to have relations with high status males, even if she's currently dating or married. According to these so-called kings, dudes, all women have an ingrained biological urge to bone alpha males, even if they've settled for some lame-ass beta who could never be her actual first choice. Basically all married men are chumps and their wives want some wicked MRA schlong. So, you know, this is just full of uh, straw man and bullshit here, but she also links to Return of Kings, uh, and... Uh, yeah, I, I think I've demonstrated enough in past videos that Return of Kings is not a fucking men's rights site, okay? It's not part of the men's rights movement. I'm not going to go into a long explanation as to why, as I've, I've debunked that bullshit numerous times in the past. But let's see if the uh, term hypergamy is on the MGTOW list. And it actually is. Every woman's innate urge and willingness to sleep with a male of higher status than the one she's currently settling for virtually guaranteeing that her boyfriend or husband is never her first choice. Now, I've got to say I don't fully agree with this um, MGTOW definition. I don't think all women are out there to, to cheat on their husbands or trade up. Uh, sure, some do, no doubt about that, just as there are some men who, you know, cheat on their wife with a younger woman. Uh, there are assholes who are both male and female, no doubt about it. Uh, but I think most men or most women fall into that category. Uh, however, there is a, a tendency for women to be attracted to men of similar status or higher status. And this makes perfect sense from a evolutionary biological point of view. Obviously, if a, a woman gets pregnant, uh, she is less capable of supporting herself for nine months from a historical point of view. It's a bit different these days with... Uh, social services and government handouts and and support networks and things like that but you know if we go back a uh, hundred thousand years to the dawn of man then yes a pregnant woman is less likely to provide for herself so it makes sense for her to mate with someone who is going to be a good provider and considering a hundred thousand years ago they didn't have the pill and there was a, a very high infant death rate uh, women typically had a lot of children. This was necessary for the survival of the species. So, yeah, from a, a biological, evolutionary point of view, hypergamy makes perfect sense. And obviously it is a um, an influence, a factor. Uh, now, it's not obviously the only factor. Uh, it's obviously not the main factor with every single woman. Every one of us is a, a very complex stew of different uh, influences, uh, some biological, some cultural. Uh, but I don't think it can be denied that typically women will go for a man who is similar or higher status. This, of course, does not mean that all women are backstabbing bitches which are going to uh, cheat on their beta male with, a, uh, with an alpha male. Although, obviously, in some cases, that does happen. Uh, let's go on to the next one. Uh, mangina. Now, <laughs> this one's an easy one. A mangina is um, the male version of internalized misogyny. So the the term often used by feminists to describe any woman who is a non-feminist or an anti-feminist is internalized misogyny. So basically, uh, so a woman with uh, internalized misogyny is a woman who hates her femininity. Now, usually this term is misused by feminists. Now, a mangina is a man who has internalized misandry, a man who hates his masculinity. Now, I, I will also admit that the term mangina is often thrown around uh, to describe people who aren't technically manginas. In other words, it can be overused, but I think there are clear, clear examples 
of uh, men who hate their own masculinity and have been taught that it's wrong. Probably the best example of uh, a mangina or mangina type thinking that I've ever come across was a blog post by MIT professor Scott Aronson. It reads, Here's the thing. I spent my formative years, basically, from the age of 12 until my mid-twenties, feeling not entitled, not privileged, but terrified. I was terrified that one of my female classmates would somehow find out that I sexually desired her, and that the instant she did, I would be scorned, left at called a creep and a weirdo, maybe even expelled from school or sent to prison. You can call that my personal psychological problem if you want, but it was strongly reinforced by everything I picked up from my environment. To take one example, the sexual assault prevention workshops we had to attend regularly as undergrads, with their endless lists of all the forms of human interaction that might be sexual harassment or assault, and their refusal, ever to specify anything that definitely wouldn't be sexual harassment or assault. I left each of those workshops with enough fresh paranoia and self-hatred to last me through another year. My recurring fantasy, through this period, was to have been born a woman, or a gay man, or best of all, completely asexual, so that I could simply devote my life to math, like my hero Paul Erdos did. Anything, really, other than the curse of having been born a heterosexual male, which for me, meant being consumed by desires that one couldn't act on or even admit without running the risk of becoming an objectifier or a stalker or a harasser or some other creature of the darkness. Of course, I was smart enough to realize that maybe this was silly, maybe I was overanalyzing things. So I scoured the feminist literature for any statement to the effect that my fears were as silly as I hoped they were. But I didn't find any. On the contrary, I found reams of text about how even the most ordinary male-female interactions are filled with microaggressions, and how even the most enlightened males, especially the most enlightened males, in fact, are filled with hidden entitlement and privilege and a propensity to sexual violence that could burst forth at any moment. Because of my fears, my fears of being outed as a nerdy heterosexual male, and therefore as a potential creep or sex criminal. I had constant suicidal thoughts. As Bertrand Russell wrote of his own adolescence, I was put off from suicide only by the desire to learn more mathematics. At one point, I actually begged a psychiatrist to prescribe drugs that would chemically castrate me. I had researched which ones, because a life of mathematical asceticism was the only future that I could imagine for myself. The psychiatrist refused to prescribe them, but he also couldn't suggest any alternative. My case genuinely stumped him. As well it might, for in some sense, there was nothing wrong with me. In a different social context, for example, that of my great-grandparents in the shtetl, I would have gotten married at an early age and been completely fine. And after a decade of being coy about it, I suppose I had finally revealed the meaning of this blog's title. All this time, I face constant reminders that the males who didn't spend months reading and reflecting about feminism and their own shortcomings, even the ones who went to the opposite extreme, who engaged in what you called, good old fashioned ass grab airy, actually had success that way. The same girls who I was terrified would pepper spray me and call the police if I looked in their direction, often responded to the crudest advances of the most Neanderthal of men by accepting those advances. Yet it was I, the nerd, and not the Neanderthals, who needed to check his privilege and examine his hidden entitlement. So, like I said, this is probably the perfect example of someone who is a mangina. Well, was a mangina. He since got over it and uh, moved on with his life. But he had been taught that his uh, natural heterosexual male sexual desires, his masculinity, was ha somehow wrong and evil. You know, like, uh, like it said earlier in the Witty Bitches uh, article, penis bad, vagina good, right? Masculinity bad, femininity good. So this was drilled into him to the point where he actually wished he was born a woman and he went to a psychiatrist and begged him to give him drugs to, to chemically castrate him. Do you maybe understand now where the term man 
China comes from. It is a man who has been taught to hate his masculinity to the point where he doesn't want to be a man. Now, this is very different than someone who's trans, right? Or someone who is uh, naturally feminine. There is nothing wrong with someone who is uh, trans. There's nothing wrong with a, a man who is naturally feminine. But to teach all men or try to teach all men or convince men who are masculine that their masculinity is wrong is fucking bullshit right to teach them to hate themselves based on a a core part of themselves which they have no control over is fucking bullshit being a mangina is having internalized misandry it's an internalized hatred of masculinity uh, but let's see what her definition of a mangina is. Noun. Men who disagree with MRAs. Femi Nazi apologists. See also, white knights. Oh, it's men who disagree with MRAs. Uh, now, uh, look, uh, I'll give her a little bit of slack. There are a lot of MRAs who will refer to uh, male feminists generally as, um, as manginas. And I... I Although some of them are, no doubt some of them do hate their own masculinity, I think the term is a bit overused to describe anyone who disagrees with MRAs. So as much as I hate doing so, I think she does have somewhat of a point here, only because the term is misused, though. Now, I will argue that the term mangina is very different than the term white knight, which I'm sure is going to appear in this list, so I won't go into what a white knight is at the moment. Let's continue with her definition. Adjective. Feminized. Pussy whipped. Uh, yeah, pussy whipped, I guess, is a, another term to uh, describe a mangina. And feminized. Um, note the term feminized, not feminine. Now, if a man is naturally feminine, I have no problem with that. But if a man is naturally masculine but has been taught that that masculinity is wrong or evil or bad and therefore has been taught or pressured into becoming feminine in other words feminized uh, yeah that is fucking wrong and that is what a mangina is but let's continue with her definition according to the manosphere a mangina or someone with mangina qualities actively seeks approval from the ladies Hoping to get in their manly, probably burlap pants. Uh, I, I don't know if the driving force behind a mangina is to get laid. I think the driving force behind a mangina is a hate of their own masculinity. And note she's using the term manosphere in general as opposed to men's rights activists. But let's continue. This makes him one of two things. A pansy ass, white knight, or a sleazy PUA, pickup artist using game to cheat the system. No one, and we mean no one is honest in life. Except for MRAs, of course. Now, <laughs> this is interesting, because clearly she um, knows the difference between pickup artists and men's rights activists based on this sentence, or these couple of sentences. So it's, it's funny that she thinks we refer to pickup artists as manginas, considering they often refer to us as manginas. It's almost like she swapped the two terms. <laughs> she's she's um, prescribed the pickup mentality, the pickup artist mentality to MRAs and, and then claiming that we refer to PUAs as they refer to us, which is just fucking weird. Uh, but let's see what the uh, MGTOW glossary has to say about it, because I'm sure that's where she got it from. A feminized pussy whipped loser who apologizes for the bad behavior of women and actively seeks their approval hoping he can get into her pants. He's nothing but an ill-informed PUA spitting a highly ineffective bastardized form of game. I know this is the MGTOW definition is interesting I, although I I disagree with their definition but it, it's clear here that where she got this information from it's it and she must have read this because she copied bits from it it's clear that she must have read that it is criticizing pickup artists and game. It's it's criticizing both pickup artists and game. 
yet she still thinks that it's all the same thing. It just just the sheer stupidity is amazing. So let's go on with the the next one on the, in the list, number fourteen, Miss Sandrist. Now this is an easy one, and yes, obviously, this is an actual term used by men's rights activists, and not only MRAs, of course, but we we do tend to use this one a fair bit. So what is a misandrist? Uh, a misandrist is someone who hates men, just like a misogynist is someone who hates women. A misandrist is someone who hates men and uh, masculinity. Now, <laughs> I have to wonder what her definition of this is going to be. Noun. Woman who denies men are God, Buddha, flying spaghetti monster, given masculinity. Any woman who won't have intercourse with an MRA. Oh boy. <laughs> so, apparently a misandrist is a woman who won't have intercourse with an MRA? Are you fucking joking? Fucking hell. What? The, the sheer idiocy of this author is just... It's just amazing. <laughs> uh, it, it has nothing to do with sleeping with uh, men or MRAs. Or women not wanting to sleep with uh, men or MRAs. It has to do with people hating men, hating masculinity. That's what Miss Andrew is. So let's continue with her definition. These folks just keep insisting that misandry is a thing. It's not. You can't be racist to a white person. You can't be heterophobic to a straight person and you can't be misandrist. These words imply a systemic imbalance and discrimination from a privileged majority. You can, however, be rude and prejudiced against white people and straight folks, and I can tell dude bros they smell like spoiled chopped liver and should be kept only for breeding purposes. It may make me a meanie, but it doesn't make me a misandrist. Uh, yeah, it does make you a misandrist. It makes you the worst type of fucking bigot is what it makes you. Um, but I, coincidentally, about half an hour ago, I watched an excellent video from John the Other who was talking about this exact same thing. So uh, let me play a couple of minutes from that. Well, there's an explanation, of course, right? It's that sexism, just I'll take that as the example. Sexism is negative prejudice against a group of people plus institutional or social power. First of all, that's not the normal definition of either sexism or racism. Right? And everybody who hears it and everybody who says it knows that it's a created definition to justify the very thing that it denounces. So, I mean, if we agree that sexism or racism are both, you know, negative, they're both bad, you shouldn't uh, enact or practice sexism or racism, what you're doing with that definition is you're implicitly admitting that you are A, a sexist, B, that you know it's bad, but C, you're going to keep doing it anyway because you crafted this cockamamie definition to see. And everybody who hears that definition given that's how they read it they hear you saying in their head i'm a racist i'm a sexist and you can't stop me haha -ha. that's what it sounds like when you say that uh, sexism which you are practicing is impossible for your group to practice because it's not just hatred of a group of people based on their sex it's also hatred plus power well Number one, that's not the actual definition. Number two, if we accept that definition, the power component is there. Is there. Because if you were not the group who had sufficient political power to actualize your either sexism or racism, you would be immediately called out, maybe booted out of the university campus or booted off the sports team or fired from your place of employment when you posited this baloney definition to justify your either sexism or racism. So then why? And, and by the way, everybody understands this to be true, even the people saying it. So then why are they saying it? Why would anybody say, uh, say something that they know is a lie, that they know other people know is a lie, that they know those other people also know that they know it's a lie, and that it is a repulsive lie that makes you look like a horrible bad person? It's like this multiple layer cake of negative characteristics all rolled into one. And every time you give that justification, you're telling other people in code, I'm a lousy motherfucker. 
people recognize their own bigotry. They recognize their own negative characteristics. And when they're called on it, it's easier to create a social narrative that says, no, 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 I'm, no, I'm not a bad person. No, I'm a good, look how good I am. I'm the example of good. Here's the definition that proves it. Because the other possibility is to, to examine your own beliefs and go, I have a real problem with other people based on whatever their ethnicity or their you know their skin color or their sexual identity or maybe their sexual orientation or maybe their religion. It's really hard to do that. It's it's like deeply unsettling. It's hard work. It's much easier to create a narrative that says no no no. I'm. It might seem like I'm a racist. But actually, I'm not, because the definition of racism is this. Therefore, oh, I'm a good person. Mm, yeah. Yeah, and I've got to say, I agree with JTO 100% on this. Now, I wonder once again, did she get this from the uh, the glossary of the MGTOW site? Uh, and uh, she did. And it, it basically says, a woman who denies a man's request to be treated like a man. I wouldn't say that is the best definition, uh, it, because... Um, yeah, actually, come to think of it, I think it's a pretty, a pretty bad definition. Uh, I, th I think the very simplistic definition of the hatred of men, or someone who hates men, is um, is more accurate. Well, that's it for another episode in this series, folks. Um, if you think I I got a definition wrong or something, please uh, explain why in the comments down below. Uh, and this, by no means, is the last in this series. I think I've got enough for at least another two videos. I probably won't have them up, though, for about another month, because uh, I've got some more serious videos to get out of the way first. Uh, but until then, always remember... Don't drink the poison Kool-Aid. Um, while we're on the topic of uh, definitions of words, I thought I would do the witty bitches a favour and actually look up the the word witty for them because they, they seem to be unaware of what the, the actual word means. So the, the definition of witty is showing or characterised by quick or inventive verbal humour. Uh, unfortunately, the witty bitches don't seem to have any of this. Um, they just seem to rely on schoolyard name-calling. <laughs> their, their whole shtick seems to be um, to belittle male sexuality in an attempt to uh, dehumanise and, and pull down people who disagree with them. I, I don't think there's anything really clever or witty about that. Uh, anyone can name-call and uh, it, it, it isn't necessarily witty. For example, if I were to call Francis Loke, who is the writer of these articles, as well as the founding editor at Witty Bitches, if I were, for example, to call her a cunt, that would not be witty. Now, it may actually be accurate, but it wouldn't be witty, would it? But just before I go, let me give you one more word and its definition. Uh, this is actually a word I've just invented after going through the Witty Bitches um, articles. Feel free to use this term in its proper context uh, as much as you like. I think you'll find it appropriate in, in many circumstances. The term is V-railing. So we all know the feminist term mansplaining, which is where a man explains something typically to a woman, in a manner which is regarded as condescending or patronising. You've restarted, fair enough. Let me, let me, let me just stop enough. you so you don't waste a line of questioning. I'm just giving you... <laughs> I love the mansplaining. I'm enjoying it. You're loving what? The mansplaining that's going on. What's... What well, just mean? talking me through how... how what do you, well, what do you, by you, not answering the question, what do you, by what do you, what do you, what do you repeating suggesting? processes which are not related to the question that I've asked. What's, what's mansplaining, Senator? 
Well, it's the slightly patronising and condescending way that you're responding to my questions. Well, I would suggest, Senator, that if you're putting the word man in front of uh, some description of what I'm doing, you're doing that which I'm sure you're very much against, is making a, a sexist implication about how I'm conducting my role well, as man. Well, then the easiest way what, to do is it... What, is that what well, you're saying, Senator? Well, what I'm saying is that the way you've been responding to me has been patronising and condescending, and I have responded to that. So the easiest by, by way to deal saying, with this is not, is, not to, imagine, Senator, is not to, to have that way in responding to the questions Imagine I've the asked. reaction, Senator, if I said you were woman-splaining. You're saying that I'm mansplaining. Well, it is a term that's used. Is it when, by whom? Well, by well, rude, it is a term that's used. By rude, doesn't, doesn't make by rude senators, uh, by senators no. who are seeking to make gender an issue. Stop being a hypocrite. Well, Conduct yourself it. appropriately for this well, place. I'm sorry you're so offended by the use of the word. It is it is a word that's used. Uh, it's it's a. I'm surprised that you're so shocked by the use of the word. No, I'm just um, I'm just calling hypocrisy. Hypocrisy. Well, thy name yes. is Labor. Thy name is Senator Gallagher. Because apparently only men can do that for some reason. Must have something to do with uh, having a penis. I'm not exactly sure why. Because, you know, women have never, ever explained something in a condescending way. Never actually happened in the history of mankind. And I'm sure none of us have examples of that that we can think of. And, of course, this is often used when, whenever a man just happens to open his mouth. <laughs> Even if he's not being condescending or patronising, uh, it, it still somehow applies for some reason. So we all know the term mansplaining. Well, my term is V-railing, right? So V-railing is when a person is discussing a, uh, a men's issue, typically a men's issue, and a feminist comes in and derails the conversation by talking about her vagina or vaginas in general. So an example is you may be trying to talk about a serious men's rights issue and a feminist will come in and derail the conversation by claiming that your only motivation is to get laid or to, to get pussy. So it's all about pussy. That is a perfect example of V-railing. Uh, another example might be that you're talking about male circumcision. And a feminist will come in and dismiss everything you say because you are not talking about female circumcision. Now, as a rule, having talked about circumcision quite a bit online, apparently if someone is talking about female genital mutilation, you are not allowed under any circumstances to mention male genital mutilation. But if you are talking about male genital mutilation, Apparently, you have to spend at least 51% of your time talking about female genital mutilation and how it's worse in every single circumstance, because apparently that's equality. Anyway, that's, that's V-railing. It's when a feminist derails the conversation to talk about her vagina or vaginas in general. Uh, you might be surprised how often that happens.